Hello and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Linode and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your data pipelines or trying out the tools you hear about on the show. And go to dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. You can help support the show by checking out the Patreon page, which is linked from the site. To help other people find the show, you can leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music, tell your friends and coworkers, and share it on social media. I've got a couple of announcements before we start the show. There's still time to register for the O'Reilly Strata Conference in San Jose, California, happening from March 5th to the 8th. Use the link dataengineeringpodcast.com slash strata-san-jose to register and save 20% off your tickets. The O'Reilly AI Conference is also coming up, happening April 29th to the 30th in New York. It will give you a solid understanding of the latest breakthroughs and best practices in AI for business. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash AICon dash new dash York to register and save 20% off the tickets. Also, if you work with data or want to learn more about how the projects you have heard about on the show get used in the real world, then join me at the Open Data Science Conference happening in Boston from May 1st through the 4th. It has become one of the largest events for data scientists, data engineers, and data-driven businesses to get together and learn how to be more effective. To save 60% off your tickets, go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash odsc east 2018 and register. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Danielle Robinson and Joe Hand about the DAT project, a distributed data sharing protocol for building applications of the future. So, Danielle, could you start by introducing yourself? Sure. My name is Danielle Robinson, and I'm the co-executive director of Code for Science and Society, which is the nonprofit that supports the DAT project. I've been working on DAT-related projects first as a partnerships director for about a year now, and I'm here with my colleague, Joe Hand. Take it away, Joe. Yeah, I'm Joe Hand, and I'm the other co-executive director and the director of operations at Code for Science and Society. And I've been a core DAT contributor for about two years now. And Danielle, starting with you again, can you talk about how you first got involved and interested in the area of data management? Sure. So um, I have a PhD in neuroscience. I finished that about a year and a half ago. Um, And what I did during my PhD, my research was focused on cell biology, really without getting into the weeds too much on that, a lot of time at microscopes, collecting um, some kind of medium-sized imaging data. And during that process, I became pretty frustrated with the academic and publishing systems that seemed to be limiting the access of access of people to the results of taxpayer-funded research. So publications are behind paywalls and data is either not published along with the paper or um, sometimes is published but not well archived and becomes inaccessible over time. So... Um, sort of compounding this, traditionally code has not really been thought of as um, an academic, uh, a scholarly work. So, um, and that's a whole another conversation, but even though these things are changing, data and code aren't shared consistently and are pretty inconsistently managed within labs. I think that's fair to say. So, and what that does is it makes it really hard to reproduce or replicate other people's research, which um, is important for the scientific process. So during my PhD, I got really active in the OpenCon and Mozilla science communities, which I encourage your listeners to check out. These communities build interdisciplinary connections between the open source world and open education, open access, and open data communities. And that's really important in order to like build things that people will actually use and make big cultural and policy changes that will make it easier to access research and share data. So it's sort of I got involved um, because of the partly because of the technical challenge, but also I'm interested in the people problems. So the changes to the incentive structure and the culture of research that are needed to make data management better on a day to day and make um, our research infrastructure stronger and more long lasting. And Joe, how did you get involved in data management? Yeah, I've sort of gone back and forth between the the sort of more academic or research data management and more traditional software side. Uh, So I I really got started involved in data management when I was at a data visualization agency. And we basically built, 
you know, pretty web-based visualization, interactive visualizations for a variety of clients. Um, this was cool because it sort of allowed me to see like a large variety of data management techniques. Uh, so there was like the small scale spreadsheet and manually updating data in spreadsheets and then sending that off to visualize and to like big Fortune 500 companies that had data warehouses and full internal APIs that we got access to. Um, so it was really cool to see that sort of variety of, of data collection and data usage between all those organizations. Um, so that was also good because it, it sort of helped me understand how, how to use data effectively. And that really means like telling a story around it. So, you know, in order to sort of use data, you have to either use some math or some visual representation and the best, the best stories around data combine sort of a bit of both of those. And then from there, I moved to a research institute and we were tasked with building a data platform for an international NGO. And they, that group basically does census data collection in slums all over the world. Um, and so as a research group, we were sort of trying interested in, in using that data for research, but we also had to help them figure out how to collect that data. Um, so before we came in with that project, they had basically been doing 30 years of data collection on paper and then simulate, sometimes manually entering that data into spreadsheets and then trying to sort of share that around through thumb drives or Dropbox or sort of whatever tools they had access to. So this was cool because it really gave me a great opportunity to see the other side of data management and analysis. So, you know, we worked with the corporate clients, which sort of have big, lots of resources and computer computer resources and cloud servers. And this was sort of the other side where there's there's very few resources. Uh, most of the, the data analysis happens offline and a lot of the data transfer happens offline. Um, so it was really cool to, and interesting to see that that a lot of the tools I'd been taking for granted sort of weren't, couldn't be applied in those in those areas. Um, and then on the research side of things, I saw that, you know, as scientists and governments, um, they were just sort of hap haphazardly organizing data in the same way. Um, so I was sort of trying to collect and download census data from about 30 countries, and we had to email, write, fax people. We got different CDs and paper documents and PDFs in other languages. Uh, so that really illustrated that there's like a lot of data managed out there in a way that that I wasn't mm -hmm. totally familiar with, and it's just it, it's just very crazy how how everybody manages their data in a different way, uh, and that's sort of a, a long what I like to call the long tail of data management. So people that don't use sort of traditional databases or manage it in their sort of unique ways, and most of the people managing data that, in that way probably wouldn't call it data, but it's just sort of what they use to get their job done. And so once I started to sort of look at alternatives to managing that research data, uh, I found that basically and, and was hooked and started to contribute. So that's sort of how I found that. So that leads us nicely into talking about what the DAT project is and uh, as much of the origin story sure. as each of you might be aware of. And Joe, you already mentioned how you got involved in the DAT project, but Danielle, if you could also share your involvement or, or how you got started with it as well. Yeah, I can tell the origin story. Um, so the DAT project is an open source community building a protocol for peer-to-peer -peer data sharing. And um, as a protocol, it's similar to HTTP and how the protocol is used today, but DAT adds extra security and automatic versioning and allows users to connect to a decentralized network in a decentralized network. Um, you can store the data anywhere, either in a cloud or in a local computer, and it does work offline. And so DAT is built to make it easy for developers to build decentralized applications without worrying about moving data around. And the people who originally developed it and that'll be uh, Matthias and Max and Carissa. Uh, they're scratching their own itch for building software to share and archive public and research data. And this is how Joe got involved, like he was saying before. And um, so it originally started as an open source project and then DAT got a grant from the Knight Foundation in 2013 uh, as a prototype grant focusing on government data. And then that was followed up in 2014 by a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and that grant focused more on scientific research um, and allowed the project to put a little more effort into working with researchers. And since then, we've been working to solve research data management problems by developing software on top of the DAT protocol. And the most recent um, project is funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and that, um, that project started in 2016. And that supports us, it's called DAT in the Lab, and um, I can get you a link to it on our blog. 
It supports us to work with um, California Digital Library and research groups in the University of California system to make it easier to move files around, version data sets, and support researchers um, through automating archiving. And so that's a really cool project because we get to work directly with researchers and do the kind of participatory design software stuff that we enjoy doing and creates things that people will actually use. And we get to learn about really exciting research, very, very different from the research I did my PhD. One of the labs we're working with studies sea star wasting disease. So it's really fascinating stuff. And we get to work right with them to make things that are gonna fit into their workflows. So I started working with DAT um, in the summer, right before that grant was funded. So I guess maybe six months before that grant was funded. And so I was came on as a consultant initially to help um, write grants and start talking about how to work directly with researchers and what um, to build that researchers would really help them uh, move their data around and version control it. So, so yeah, that's how I became involved. And then in the fall, I uh, transitioned to a, a partnerships position and then the ED position in the last month. And you mentioned that a lot of the sort of boost to the project has come in the form of grants from a few different foundations. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about how those different grants have influenced the focus and pace of the development that was possible for the project. Yeah, I mean, that really occupies a unique position in the open source world with that grant funding. So, you know, for the first few years, it was closer to sort of a, a research project than a traditional product focused startup and other projects, other open source projects like that might be done part time as a side project or just sort of for fun. But the grant funding really allowed uh, the original developers to sign on and work full time, um, really solving harder problems than they might might be able to otherwise. So since we sort of got those grants, we've been able to toe the line between a more user facing product and some research software. And the the grant really gave us the opportunity to, to toe that line, but also get in the field and connect with researchers and end users so we can sort of innovate in, with technical solutions, but really ground those real in reality with, with specific scientific use cases. Um, so, you know, this balance is really only possible because of that grant funding, which sort of gives us more flexibility and might have a little longer timeline than than VC money or, or just like an open source um, side project. But now we're really at a, a critical juncture, I'd say, where, where grant funding is not quite enough to, to cover what we want to do. Um, but we're lucky because the protocol is really getting in a more stable position and we're starting to to look at those user facing products on top and starting to build those those around around the core protocol. And the fact that you have received so many different rounds of grant funding sort of lends credence to the fact that you're solving a critical problem that lots of people are coming up against. And I'm wondering if there are any other projects or companies or organizations that are trying to tackle similar or related problems that you sort of view as co-collaborators or competitors in the space? Or do you think that the DAP project is fairly uniquely positioned to solve the specific problems that it's addressing? Yeah, I mean, I would say we have, you know, there are other similar use cases and, and tools. And, you know, a lot of that is around sharing open data sets and sort of that, the publishing of data, which Danielle might be able to talk more about. But on the on the sort of technical side, there is, you know, other, I guess the biggest competitor or, or similar thing might be IPFS, which is another sort of decentralized protocol for, for sharing and, and storing data in different ways. But we're really, we're actually, you know, excited to work with these various companies. So, you know, IPFS is more of a, a storage focused format. So basically allows content based storage on a distributed network. And that's really more about sort of the, the transfer protocol and and being very interoperable with all these other solutions. So, yeah. You know, that's what we're more excited about is trying to understand how we can how we can use that in collaboration with all these other groups. Yeah, I think I'm I'm just plus one what Joe said through my time coming up in the OpenCon community and the Mozilla Science community. There are a lot of people trying to improve access to data broadly. And I, most of the people, I, you know, everyone in the space really takes a collaboration, not competition sort of approach because 
there are a lot of different ways to solve the problem depending on who wh what the end user wants um, and there are there's a lot of great projects working in the space I would agree with Joe I guess that IPFS is the thing that people sometimes you know like I'll be at a, an event and someone will say what's the difference between debt and IPFS and I answer pretty much how Joe just answered but it's important to note that we know those people and uh, we have good relationships with them and We've actually just been emailing with them about some kind of collaboration over in the next year. So it's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of really great projects in the open data and improving access to data space. And I like basically support them all. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully <laughs> uh, there's so much work to be done that um, I think there's room for all the people in the space. And now that you have established a nonprofit organization around DAT, are there any particular plans that you have to support future sustainability and growth for the project? Yes, the future sustainability and growth for the project is what we wake up and think about every day, sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, it's the most important thing. Uh, and incorporating the nonprofit was a, a big step that happened, I think, uh, at the end of 2016. And so it's critical as we move DAT towards a self-sustaining future. And importantly, it'll also allow us to continue to support and incubate other open source projects in the space, which is something that I'm really excited about. For DAT, our goal is to support a core group of DAT contributors through grants, and revenue sharing, and donations. And so over the next 12 months, we'll be pursuing grants and corporate donations, as well as rolling out an open collective page to help facilitate smaller donations and continuing to develop products with an eye towards things that can generate revenue and support that, that ecosystem. At the same time, we're also focusing on sustainability within the project itself. And what I mean by that is, you know, governance, immunity management, and so we are right now working with the DAT developer community uh, to formalize the technical process on the protocol through a working group. And those are really great calls. Lots of great people are involved in that. And we really want to make sure the protocol decisions are made transparently uh, and it can involve a wider group of the DAT community in the process. And we also want to make the path to participation, involvement, and community leadership clear for newcomers. So by supporting the DAT developer community, we hope to encourage like new and exciting implementations of the DAT protocol. Um, some of the stuff that happened in 2017, you know, from my perspective, working in the science and sort of came out of nowhere and people were building, you know, amazing new social networks based on DAT. And it was really fun and exciting. And so just keeping the community healthy and making sure that the the technical process and how decisions get made is really clear and transparent, I think was going to facilitate even more of that. And just another comment about being a nonprofit, because Code for Science and Society is a nonprofit, where we also act as a fiscal sponsor. And what that means is that like minded projects who get grant funding but are not nonprofits, so they can't accept the grant, they run their grant through us. And then we take a small percentage of that grant and we use that to help those projects by linking them up with our community. I work with them on grant writing and fundraising and strategy. We'll support their own community engagement efforts and sometimes offer technical support. And we see this as really important to the ecosystem and a way to help smaller projects develop and succeed. So right now we do that with two projects. One of them is called Stencilla, and I can send a link for that. Um, and the other one is called Science Fair. Uh, Stencilla is an open source reproducible document software funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. It's looking to support researchers through, from data collection to document authoring. And Science Fair is a peer-to-peer -peer library built on DAT, which is designed to make it easy for scholars to curate collections of research on a certain topic, annotate them, and share it with their colleagues. And so that project was funded by um, a prototype grant from a publisher called eLife, and they're looking for additional funding. So we're working with both of them. And in the first quarter of this year, Joe and I are working to formalize the process of how we work with these other projects and what we can offer them. And hopefully we'll be in the position to take on additional projects later this year. But I really enjoy that work. And I think as someone, so I went through the a Mozilla Fellowship, which was like a 10 month long, crazy period where Mozilla invested a lot in me and making sure I was meeting people and learning how to write grants and learning how to give good talks and all kinds of 
awesome investment. And so for a person who goes through a program like that or a person who has a side project, there's, um, kind of, there's a need for um, groups in the space who can incubate those projects and help them as they develop from, from the incubator stage to the you know, middle stage before they scale up. So I, I, I'm thinking there's, so as a fiscal sponsor, we, we're hoping to be able to support projects in that space. And digging into the DAP protocol itself, when I was looking through the documentation, it mentioned that the actual protocol itself is agnostic to the implementation. And I know that the current reference implementation is done in JavaScript. So I'm wondering if you can describe a bit about how the protocol itself is designed, how the reference implementation is uh, done, and how the overall protocol has evolved since it was first started and what your approach is to versioning the protocol itself to ensure that people who are implementing it in other technologies or formats are able to ensure that they're compliant with specific versions of the protocol as it evolves. Yeah, so that's basically a combination of ideas from from Git, BitTorrent, and just the the web in general. Um, and so there are a few key properties in DAT that basically any implementation has to recreate. And those are content integrity, um, decentralized mirroring of the data sets, network privacy, incremental versioning, and then random access to the data. Uh, so we have a white paper that sort of explains all these in depth, um, but I'll sort of explain how they work maybe in a basic use case. Uh, so let's say I want to send some data to Danielle, which I do all the time. And I have a spreadsheet where I keep track of my coffee intake. Intake, So I want to live sync that to Danielle's computer so she can make sure I'm not over caffeinating myself. So sort of similar to how you get started with Git, I would put my spreadsheet in a folder and create a new DAT. And so whenever I create a new DAT, it makes a new key pair. So one's a public key and one's a private key. And the public key is basically the DAT link. So kind of like a URL. So you can use that in any anything that speaks with the DAT protocol, and you can just sort of open that up and look at all the files inside of that. And then the, the private key allows me to write files to the DAT and is used to sign any of the new changes. And so the private key allows Danielle to verify that I, the changes actually came from me and that somebody else wasn't, wasn't trying to fake my data or somebody wasn't trying to man in the middle my, my data when I was transferring it to Danielle. So I add my spreadsheet to the DAT and then the what DAT does is break that file into little chunks. It hashes all those chunks and creates a Merkle tree with that. And that Merkle tree basically has lots of cool properties and is one of the key, key sort of features of DAT. So the Merkle tree allows us to sparsely replicate data. So if we had a, a really big data set and you only wanted one file, um, we can sort of use the Merkle tree to download one file and then still verify the integrity of that content uh, with that incomplete data set. And the other part that allows us to do that is the registers. So all the files are stored in one register and all the metadata is stored in another register. And these registers are basically append only ledgers. Um, they're also sort of known as uh, secure registers. Um, Google has a project called Certificate Transparency that has similar ideas. And these registers basically you append, whenever new file changes, you might append that to the metadata register and that register stores basic information about the structure of the file system, um, what version it is, and then any um, other metadata like the creation time or the change time of that file. And so right now, you know, as you said, Tobias, we, we sort of are very flexible on sort of how things are implemented. But right now we basically store the files as files. Um, so that sort of allows for people to see the files normally and interact with them normally. But the cool part about that is that the, the on-disk file storage can be really flexible. So as long as the implementation um, has random access, basically, then they can store it in any different way. So we have, for example, a, a, store, a storage model built for the server that stores all of the files as a single file. So that sort of allows you to have less file descriptors open and sort of shut, gets the, the file I.O. Um, all all constrained to one file. So once my file gets added, I can share my link privately with Danielle and I can send that over chat or something or just paste it somewhere. And then she can clone my DAT on using our command line tool or the desktop tool or the Beaker browser. 
And when she clones my dat, our computers basically connect directly to each other. So we use a variety of mechanisms to try and do that connection. That's been one of the challenges that I can talk about later, is sort of how to, how to connect peer to peer and the challenges around that. But then once we do connect, uh, we'll transfer the data either over TCP or UDP. So those are our default um, network protocols that we use right now. But yeah, that can be implemented basically on any other protocol. I think Matthias once said that, that if you could implement it over carrier pigeon, that would work fine as long as you had a lot of pigeons. So we're really open to sort of how, how the, the data as far as the protocol information gets transferred. And we're working over a DAT over HTTP implementation too. So this wouldn't be peer-to-peer, -peer, but it would allow basically a traditional server fallback if no peers are online or for services that, that don't want to run a peer-to-peer -peer for whatever reason. Once Danielle clones my DAT, she can open it just like a normal file and plug it into R or Python or whatever and use her equation to measure my caffeine level. And then let's say I drink another cup of coffee and update my spreadsheet, uh, the changes will basically automatically be synced to her as long as she's still connected to me and it'll, it'll be synced throughout the network to anybody else that's connected to me. So the metadata register stores that updated file information, and then the content register stores just the change file block. So Danielle only has to sync the, the diff of that content change um, rather than the whole data set again. So this is really useful for the, the big data sets. So you don't have to sync the whole thing. And yeah, we've tried to design basically each of these pieces to be as modular as possible, both within our JavaScript Im implementation, but also in the protocol in general. So. Right now, developers can swap other network protocols, data storage. Um, so for example, if you want to use DAT in the browser, you can use WebRTC for the network and discovery and then use IndexedDB for data storage. So IndexedDB has random access, so you can just plug that in um, directly into DAT. And we have some modules for those, and that should be working. We did have a WebRTC implementation we were supporting for a while, but we found it a bit inconsistent for our use cases, which is you know more around like large file sharing, um, but it still might be okay for for chat and other more text-based things. Um, so, yeah, all of our implementations in Node right now. Um, I think that was that was both for for usability and dev developer friendliness, and also just being able to work in the browser and across platforms. Um, so we can distribute a binary now of DAT pretty easily, and you can run DAT in the browser or build DAT tools on Electron. So it sort of allows a wide range of, of developer tools built on top of that. Um, but we have a few community members now um, working on different implementations in Rust and C, I think, are the two, the two that are going right now. Um, and so as far as the, the protocol versioning, um, that was actually one of the big conversations we were having in the last working group meeting and that's to be decided basically, but through, through the stages we've gone through, we've broken it quite a few times and now we're finally in a place where we, we wanna make sure not to break it moving forward. So there's sort of space in the protocol for information like version history or, or version of the protocol. Um, so we'll probably use that to signal the version and just figure out how, how the tools that are implementing it can fall back to the latest version. Uh, so before, before all this sort of file-based stuff, that went through a different, a few different stages. It started really as a more like versioned uh, decentralized database. And then as, as Max and Matthias and Carissa sort of moved to the scientific use cases, they sort of removed more and more of the database architecture as it, as it moved on and matured. So we basically, that transition was really driven by like user feedback and watching how researchers work. And we realized that so much of research data is still kept in files and basically moved manually between the machines. So even if we were to build like a, a special database, a lot of researchers still wouldn't be able to use that because that sort of requires more, more infrastructure than they're, they have time to support. Um, so we really just kept working to build a general purpose solution that allows other people to build tools to solve those, those more specific problems. Um, and the last point is that right now, all data transfer is basically one way. So only one person can update the source. Uh, this is really useful for a lot of our research, is ca research cases where they're getting data from lab equipment where there's like a specific source and you just want to disseminate that information to various computers, but it really doesn't work for collaboration. So that's sort of the next thing that we're working on, but we really want to make sure to solve, solve the sort of one-way problem before we move to the, the harder problem of collaborative 
data sets. Uh, and this last major iteration is sort of the hardest, and that's what we're working in right now, but it sort of allows multiple users to write to the same DAT. And with that, we sort of get into problems like um, conflict resolution and, and duplicate updates and other, other sort of harder distributed computing problems. And that partially answers one of the next questions I had, which was to ask about conflict resolution. But if there's only one source that's allowed to update the information, then that solves a lot of the problems that might arise by syncing all these data sets between multiple machines because there aren't going to be multiple parties changing the data concurrently. So you don't have to worry about how to handle those use cases. And another question that I had from what you were talking about is the cryptography aspect of that it sounds as though when you initialize the dat it just automatically generates the private key and so that private key is canonically linked with that particular data set but is there any way to uh, use for instance keybase or gpg to sign the source dat in addition to the generated key to establish your identity for some for when you're trying to share that information publicly and not necessarily via some channel that already has established trust? Yeah, I mean, you can sort of, so once, I mean, you could like do that within the DAT. Um, we don't really have any mechanism for doing that on top of DAT. Uh, so it's, you know, we're sort of going to throw that into user land right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a good good question. And we've, we've had some people, ex I think, experimenting with different identity systems and, and how to solve that problem. And I think we're, we're pretty excited about the, the new Wire app because that's open source and it uses end-to-end -end encryption and it has some identity system. And we're sort of trying to see if we can sort of build that on top of Wire. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that we're just sort of experimenting with. And one of the primary use cases that is mentioned in the documentation and the website for DAT is being able to host and distribute open data sets with a focus being on researchers and academic use cases. So I'm wondering if you can talk some more about how DAT helps with that particular effort and what improvements it offers over some of the existing sure, solutions that, that researchers one. were um, using prior to the introduction of So there are the solutions for both hosting and distributing data. And in terms of hosting and distribution, there's a lot of great work um, focused on data publication and making sure that uh, data associated with publications is available online. And so I'm thinking about Zenodo and Dryad or Dataverse there are also um, other data hosting platforms such as CCAN or data.world. And we really love the work these people do and we've collaborated with some of them or we're involved in like um, organization of friendly org people like for the uh, Open Source Alliance for Open Scholarship um, has some people from Dryad who are involved in it. And so it's nice to work with them and we'd love to work with them to use DAT to upload and distribute data. But um, right now, if researchers need to feed, if researchers need to share files between many machines and keep them updated in version, so for example, if there's a large live updating data set, there really aren't great solutions to address data versioning and sharing. So in terms of sharing and transferring, lots of researchers still manually copy files between machines and servers um, or use tools like rsync or FTP, um, which is how I handled it during my PhD. Other software such as Globus or even Dropbox Box um, can require more IT infrastructure than a small research group may have. Um, researchers, like, you know, they are all operating on limited grant funding and um, they also depend on the IT structure of their institution to get them access to certain things. So a researcher like me might spend all day collecting a terabyte of data on a microscope and then wait for hours or wait overnight to move it to another location. And the ideal situation from um, a data management perspective is that those raw data are automatically archived to the lab server and sent to the researcher's computer for processing. So you have an archived copy of the raw data that came off of the equipment. And then the processed files also need to be archived, so you need archive is of the imaging files in this case at each step in processing. And then when a publication is ready, the data processing pipeline, in order for it to be fully reproducible, you'll need the code and you'll need the data at different stages. And even without access to a compu the computer or the cluster where the analysis was done, um, 
a person should be able to re repeat that. And I say ideally because this isn't really how it's happening now. Um, archiving data at different steps can be the, some of the things that stop that from happening are just um, cost of storage and the availability of storage and researcher habits. So I definitely you know, know some researchers who kept data on hard drives in Tupperware to protect them in case the sprinklers ever went off, which isn't really like a long-term solution, <laughs> true facts. Um, so DAT can make um, auto can automate these archiving steps at, at different checkpoints and make the backups easier for researchers. As a former researcher, I'm interested in anything that makes better data management automatic for researchers. And so we're also interested in version compute environments to help labs avoid the drawer full of jazz drives problem, which is sadly a quote from a senior scientist who was describing a bunch of data collected by her lab that she can no longer access. She has the drawer, she has the jazz drives, she can't get in them. That data is essentially lost. And so researchers are really motivated to make sure um, when things are archived, they're archived in a form where they can actually be accessed. But I think because researchers are so busy, it's really hard to know like um, when that is. So um, I think because we're, so focused on um, essentially like filling in the gaps between the services that researchers use and that work well for them and automating things. I think that that's in a really good position to solve some of these problems. And if you have, you know, some of the researchers that we're working with now, I'm thinking of one person who has a, a large data set and a bioinformatic pipeline, and he's at a UC lab and he wants to get all the information to his collaborator in Washington state. And it's taken months and he has not been able to do it or he can get, he can't, he just can't move that data across institutional lines. So, um, and that's a much longer conversation as to like why exactly that isn't working, but um, we're working with him to try to just uh, make him, make it possible for him to move the data and create um, a, a versioned iteration or a versioned emulation of his compute environment so that his collaborator can just do what he was doing and not need to spend four months worrying about dependencies and stuff. So yeah, hopefully that is the question. And one of the other difficult aspects of building a peer to peer protocol is the fact that in order for there to be sufficient value in the protocol itself is there needs to be a network behind it of people to be able to share that information with and share the bandwidth requirements for being able to distribute that information. So I'm wondering how you have approached the effort of building up that network and how much progress you feel you have made in that effort. Yeah, I'm not sure we really view that as, as that traditional peer-to-peer -peer protocol. I'm using that model sort of relying on, on network effects to scale. So, you know, as Danielle said, we're just trying to get data from A to B. And so our critical mass uh, is basically two users on a given data set. So we actually want to first build something that offers better tools for those two users over a traditional cloud or client server model. So if I'm transferring files to another researcher using Dropbox, um, you know, we have to transfer files via a third party and a third computer um, before it can get to the other computer. So rather than going direct between two computers, we have to go through a detour. And this has implications for speed, but also security, bandwidth usage, and even something like energy usage. Uh, so by cutting off that third computer, we feel like we're, we're already val adding value to the network. And we're sort of hoping that when, when researchers are doing this A to B transfer, um, they, they can sort of see the value of going directly and, and using something that is versioned and can and li be live synced um, over existing tools like rsync or FTP or other commercial services um, that might store data in the cloud. And, you know, we really don't have anything against these centralized services. Uh, we sort of recognize that they're very useful sometimes, but they they also aren't the answer to everything. And so depending on the use case, a de decentralized system might make more sense than a centralized one. And so we sort of want to offer a developer and users that option to make that choice, which we don't really have right now. But in order to do that, we really have to start with peer-to-peer -to -peer tools first. And then once we have that decentralized network, we can basically limit the network to one server appear in many clients and then all of a sudden it's centralized. So we sort of understand that that it's easy to go from decentralized to centralized, but it's harder to go the other way around. So we sort of have to start with a, 
a peer-to-peer -peer network in order to solve all these different problems. And the other thing is that we sort of know file systems are not going away. We know that the web browsers will continue to support static files. And we also know that people basically want to move these things between computers, back them up, archive them, share them to different computers. So we sort of know files are going to be transferred a lot in the future. And that's something we can, we can depend on. And they probably even want to do this in a secure way sometimes, and maybe in an offline environment or a local network. And so we're basically trying to build from that those basic principles um, using sort of peer-to-peer -peer transfer as the sort of bedrock of all that. And that's sort of how we got to, to where we are now with the peer-to-peer -peer network. But we're not really worried that, that we need a certain number of or a critical mass of users to add value because we just sort of feel like by building the right tools um, with these principles, we can, we can start adding value, whether it's a, a decentralized network or a centralized network. And one of the other use cases that's been built on top of that is being able to build websites and applications that can be viewed via web browsers and distributed peer-to-peer -peer in that manner. So I'm wondering how much uptake you've seen in usage for that particular application of the protocol and how much development effort is being focused on that particular use case. Yeah, so you know, if I open my Beaker browser right now, which is the main the main web implementation we have that Paul Frazy and Tara Bansell are working on, you know, if I open my my Beaker browser, I think I usually have fifty to one hundred or sometimes two hundred peers that I connect to right away. So that's through some of the the social network um, copies like uh, Rotond or Fritter, um, and then just some like personal sites. And you know, we've sort of been working with the Beaker browser folk probably for two years now. Um, sort of co-developing the protocol and and seeing what they need support for in Beaker. But, you know, it sort of come back, comes back to that basic principle that we can recognize that a lot of websites are static files. And if we can just sort of support static files in the best way possible, then you can browse a lot of websites. And that even gives you the benefit of things that are more interactive. We know that they have to be developed so they work offline too. So both Rotond and Twitter, uh, can work offline and then once you get back online you can just sync the data sort of seamlessly so that's sort of the most exciting part about those you mean fritter not twitter oh yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> fritter is the twitter clone that um tara vansel and paul made beaker is a lot of fun and if you've never played around with it i would encourage you to um download it at i think it's just at beakerbrowser.com and um, I'm not a developer by trade, but I have seriously enjoyed playing around on Beaker. And um, I think the some of the more um, frivolous things like Fritter that have come out of it uh, are a lot of fun and really speak to the potential of peer-to-peer -peer networks um, in, in today's era as people are becoming increasingly frustrated with centralized platforms. And the fact that the content that's being distributed via DAT using the Beaker browser is primarily static in nature, I'm wondering how that affects the sort of architectural patterns that people are used to using with the common three-tier architecture. And what are, you, you've already mentioned a couple of social network applications that have been built on top of it, but I'm wondering if there are any others that are built on top of and delivered via DAT that you're aware of that you can talk about that speak to uh, some of the ways that people are taking advantage of that in more of the consumer space. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the big shifts that have made this easier is having um, databases in the browser. So things like IndexedDB or other um, local storage databases, and then being able to sync those to other computers. So as long as you sort of know that I'm writing to my database and that, you know, if I'm writing my, I think people are trying to build um, games off this. So, you know, you could build a chess game where I write to my local database and then you have some logic for um, determining if a move is valid or not and then syncing that to your competitor. You know, it sort of provides, it's a more constrained environment, but I think that also gives you a benefit of of sort of being able to constrain your development and, and not requiring um, these external services or external database calls or whatever. I know that I've tried a few times to sort of develop projects are just like fun little things and it is a challenge it's the challenge because you sort of have to think differently how those things work and you can't rely necessarily on on external services you know whether that's something as simple as like loading fonts from external service or css styles or whatever external javascript um, you sort of want that all to be packaged within one one dat if you want to ensure it's all going to work so it's definitely um, 
has you know you think of a little differently like, even on those those simple things um but yeah it does constrain the sort of bigger applications and you know i think the other area that that we could see development is more in electron applications um so maybe not in beaker but el electron uh using that sort of framework as as a platform for other types of applications that might need those more um sort of flexible models so science fair which is one of our hosted projects uh, is a really good example of how how to use that in a way to distribute data, um, but still sort of have a, a full application. So basically you can distribute all the data for the application over DAT and keep it updated um, through the live syncing and users can basically download the, the PDFs that they need to read or the journals or the figures they wanna read. Um, and just download whatever they want. So it's sort of allowing developers to have that flexible model where you can distribute things peer to peer and have both the live syncing, but also just downloading whatever data the users need and just providing that framework for, for that data management. And one of the other challenges that's posed particularly for this uh, public distribution use case is that of content discovery because the, by default, the DAT URLs that are generated are private and unguessable because they're essentially just hashes of the content. So I'm wondering if there are any particular mechanisms that you either have built or planned or started discussing for being able to facilitate content discovery of the information that's being distributed by these different DAT networks. Yeah, this is definitely an open question. I, I sort of fall back on my common answer, which is depends on the the tool that we're using and the different communities. And there's gonna be different approaches. Some might be more decentralized and some might be centralized. So for example, with data set discovery, you know, there's a lot of good centralized services for data set publishing, as Daniel mentioned, like Zenodo or Dataverse. So these are places that already have um, discovery engines, I guess I'll say, uh, and they publish data sets. So, you know, you could sort of similarly publish a DAT URL along with those, those data sets so that people could sort of have an alternative way to download those data sets. So that's that's sort of one way that we've been thinking about discovery is sort of leveraging these existing solutions that are doing a really good job in their domain and trying to work with them to start using that for their, their data management. Another sort of hacky solution, I guess I'll say, is using existing domains in DNS. So basically you can publish a regular HTTP site on your URL and give it a specific um, well-known file and that points to your DAT address and then the Beaker browser can find that file and tell you that a peer-to-peer -peer, um, version of that site is available. So we're basically leveraging the existing DNS infrastructure to start to discover content just with existing URLs. And I think a lot of the discovery will be more community-based. So in, for example, Fritter and Rotond, um, people are starting to build crawlers or, or search bots. Um, to discover users or search. And so basically just sort of looking at where there's need and identifying um, you know, different types of crawlers to build and, and how to connect those communities in different ways. So we're really excited to see what, what ideas pop in that, in that area and, and they'll probably come in a, in a decentralized way, we hope. <laughs> And for somebody who wants to start using DAT, what is involved in creating and or consuming the content that's available on the network, or if there are any particular resources that are available to get somebody up to speed and understand how it works and some of the different uses that they could put it to? Sure, um, I can take that. And Joe, just chime in if you think of anything else. Uh, we built a tutorial for our work with the labs and for MozFest this year that's at try-.com. And this tutorial takes you through how to work with the command line tool and some basics about Beaker. Um, and please tell us if you find a bug. There may be bugs. Warning. But uh, it was working pretty well when I used it last. And it's in the browser. Um, and you can either share DAT with yourself. It spins up a little um, virtual machine. So you can share data with yourself or you can do it with a friend and share data with your friend. So uh, Beaker is also super easy for a user who wants to get started. You can visit pages over DAT just like you would a normal web page. Um, for example, you can go to this website and we'll um, give Tobias the link to that and just change the HTTP to DAT. 
and so it looks like dat colon slash slash jhan dot space and uh, beaker also has this fun thing that lets you create a new site with a single click and you can also fork sites and edit them and make your own copies of things which is fun if you're like learning about how to build simple websites um, so you can go to beakerbrowser.com and learn about that and I think we've already talked about Rotond and Fritter, and we'll add links in to um, people who want to learn more about that. And then for data-focused users, you can use DAT for sharing or transferring files, either with the desktop application or the command line in interface. And so if you're interested, we encourage you to play around. The community is really friendly and helpful to new people. Joe and I are always on the IRC channel or on Twitter, so if you have questions, feel free to ask, and um, we love talking to new people because that's how all the exciting stuff happens in this community. So. And what have been some of the most challenging aspects of building the project in the community and promoting the use cases and capabilities of the project? Um, I can speak a little bit to promoting it. In the academic research, um, so in academic research, probably similar to many of the industries where your listeners work, software decisions are not always made for entirely rational reasons. Um, there's a tension between what your boss wants, what the ID department has approved that meets institutional data security needs, and then the perceived time cost of developing a new workflow and getting used to a new protocol. So we try to work directly with researchers to make sure the things we build are easy and secure, but it is a lot of promotion and outreach to get their scientists to try a new workflow. They're really busy and um, the incentives are all, you know, get more grants, do more projects, publish more papers. And so even if something will eventually make your life easier, it's hard to sink in that time up front. One thing I notice, and this is probably common to all industries, is that people will, I'll be talking to someone and they'll say, oh, you know, archiving the data for my research group is not a problem for me. And then they'll proceed to describe a super problematic data management workflow. And it's not a problem for them anymore because they're used to it. So it doesn't hurt day to day. But, you know, doing things like waiting until the point of publication, then try to go back and archive all the raw data. Maybe some was collected by a postdoc who's now gone. Other was collected by a summer student who used a non-standard naming scheme for all the files, um, you know, there's just a million ways that that stuff can go wrong. So for now, we're focusing on developing real world use cases and participating in, you know, community education around data management. And we want to build stuff that's meaningful for researchers and others who work with data. And we think that by working with people and doing the nonprofit thing with the grants, it's going to be the way to get us there. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about building? Yeah, sure. So, you know, in terms of building it, I mean, I haven't done too much work on the core protocol, so I can't say much around the, the difficult design decisions there. Um, I'm the main developer on the command line tool, and the most of the challenging decisions there are all, all are about sort of user interfaces, not necessarily technical problems. And so, as Danielle said, it's sort of as much about people as it is around software and, and those decisions. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the the most challenging thing that we've run into a lot is is basically network issues. So in the peer-to-peer -peer network, um, you know, you have to figure out how to connect two peers directly in a network. They might not be supposed to do that. So I think a lot of that is from BitTorrent sort of making different institutions uh, restrict peer-to-peer -peer networking in different ways. And and so we're, we're sort of having to fight that battle against these existing restrictions and um, trying to find out how these networks are restrictive and, and how we can continue to have success in connecting peers directly rather than through, through a third party server. Um, and it's funny cause, or maybe not funny, but some of the strictest networks we found are actually in, uh, academic institutions. And so, uh, you know, some, for example, at one of the UC campuses, I think we found out that computers can never connect directly to other computers on that same network. So, if we wanted to transfer data between two computers sitting right next to each other, uh, we basically have to go through an external cloud server just to get it to the computer sitting right next to each other, or you know, use something like a hard drive uh, or a thumb drive or whatever. Um, but you know, that sort of thing, all these different sort of network configurations, I think, is one of the the hardest parts, both in terms of implementation, but also in terms of testing, since we can't we can't like readily get into these UC campuses or sort of see what the what the network setup is. So we're sort of trying to 
create more tools around network testing and both testing um, networks in the wild, but also just sort of using virtual networks to test different different types of network setups and sort of leverage that those two things combined to try and get around around all these network connection issues. Um, so yeah, I think you know I, I I would love to ask Matthias too this question around the design decisions in terms of the core protocol, but but I can't really say much about that unfortunately. <laughs> And are there any particularly interesting or inspiring uses of DAT that you're aware of that you'd like to share? Sure, I can share a couple of things that we were involved in. Um, during last, in January 2016, we were involved in the data rescue in libraries plus network community. And that was the movement to archive government funded research at trusted public institutions like libraries and archives. And as a part of that, we got to work with some of the really awesome people at California Digital Library. California Digital Library is really cool because it is um, a digital library with a mandate to preserve and ar archive and steward the data that's produced in the UC system, and it supports the entire UC system, and the people are great. Um, and so we worked with them to make the, be the first ever backup of data.gov in January of 2016, and I think my colleague had 40 terabytes of metadata sitting in his living room for a while as we were uh, working up to the transfer. Um, and so that was a really cool project and it has produced a, a useful thing and it's sort of, you know, we got to work with some of the data.gov people to make that happen and they, you know, they were like, huh, there really it has never been backed up, but it was a good time to do it. But believe it or not, it's actually pretty hard to find funding for that work and we have more work we'd like to do in that space. Um, archiving copies of federally funded research at trusted institutions is a really critical step towards ensuring the long time preservation of the research that gets done in this country. So hopefully 2018 we'll see those projects funded or new collaborations in that space. Also it's a fantastic community because it's a lot of really interesting librarians and archivists who have great perspective on long-term data preservation and I love working with them so hopefully we can do something else there. Um, then the other thing that I'm really excited about is the working on the DAT in the lab project working for on the DAT container issue and I don't I know we're a little over time so I don't know how much I should go into this but we've learned a lot about really interesting research and so we're working to develop a container based emulation of of a research computing cluster that can run on any machine or in the cloud and then by creating a container that will include the complete software environment of the cluster researchers across the UC system can quickly get analysis pipelines that they're working on um, usable in other locations and this you know, believe it or not is a is a big problem i was sort of surprised when one researcher told me she had been working for four months to get a pipeline running at uc merced that had been developed at ucla and that's like you could drive back and forth between merced and ucla a bunch of times <laughs> in four months um, but it's this uh, little stuff that really slows research down. And so um, I'm really excited about the potential there. And we wrote, we've written a couple blog posts on that. So I can add the links um, to those blog posts in the, in the follow-up. And I'd say the, the most novel use that I'm sort of excited about is called Hypervision. And it's basically video streaming built on DAT. Uh, Matthias Boos, one of the, the lead developers on DAT is prototyping Sort of something similar with the Danish public TV, and they basically want to live stream their their channels um, over the peer-to-peer -peer network. So I'm excited about that because I'd really love to get more public television and public radio distributing content peer-to-peer, -peer so we can sort of reduce their their infrastructure costs and hopefully allow for for more of that great content to come out. Are there any other topics that we didn't discuss yet, which you think we should talk about before we close out the show? I'm feeling pretty good. What about you, Joe? Yeah, I think that that's it for me. Okay. So for anybody who wants to keep up to date with the work you're doing or get in touch, I'll have you each add your preferred contact, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as a final question to give the listeners something else to think about, from your perspective, what is the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today? I'd say transferring files, which it feels really funny to say that, but to me, it's still a problem that's not really well solved. Just how do you get files from A to B in a consistent and easy to use manner? Uh, I especially want a solution that doesn't really require a command line 
and is still secure and hopefully doesn't go through a, a third party service um, because hopefully that means it works offline. So a lot of what I saw in this sort of developing world is the need for data management that works offline. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest gaps that uh, we don't really address yet. So there are a lot of great data management tools out there, but I think they sort of aim more at data scientists or software focused users that might use managed databases or something like Hadoop. But there's really a ton of users out there that don't really have tools they need. And most of the world is still offline or with inconsistent internet and putting everything through the servers on the cloud isn't really feasible. Um, but the alternatives now require sort of careful data management and manual data management if you don't want to lose all your data. So we really hope to to find a good balance between those those two needs and those two use cases. Yeah, I'll uh, plus one with Joe said, transferring files. It does feel funny to say that, but it is still a problem in a lot of industries, um, especially where I come from in research science. Uh, and from my perspective, I guess the other issue is that you know the people problems are always as hard or harder than the technical problems so if people don't think that it's important to share data or archive data in an accessible and usable form we could have the world's best easy to use tool and it wouldn't impact the landscape or the accessibility of data and similarly if people are sharing data that's not usable because it's missing experimental context or it's in a proprietary format or because it's shared under a restrictive license it's also not going to impact the landscape or, or um, be useful to the scientific community or the public. So working to change, we want to build great tools, but I also want to work to change the incentive structure and research to ensure that good data management practices are rewarded and so that data is shared in a usable form. That's really key. And um, I'll add a link in the show notes to the FAIR data principles, which uh, means data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is something that your listeners might want to check out if they're not familiar with it. It's a framework developed in academia, but it, um, I'm not sure actually how much impact it's had outside of that sphere, but it would be interesting to talk to your listeners a little bit about that. And yeah, I'm, I'll put my contact info in the show notes, and I'd love to connect with anyone and, or answer any further questions about DAT and what we're going to try to do with Code for Science and Society over the next year. So thanks a lot, Tobias, for inviting us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both for taking the time out of your days to join me and talk about the work you're doing. Uh, it's definitely a very interesting project with a lot of useful potential. And so I'm excited to see where you go from now into the future. So thank you both for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>